Um, I'm Richard Fulton. I'm the director of the Planning Inspectorate in, in Wales. Um, what I want to do this morning is have a, a very rapid canter through the subject matter of what we do, who we are, how we do it, and a bit about planning, uh, with a view to exploding a few myths and misunderstandings, and perhaps helping you as, as people at the ground level, ground floor, of getting involved with the planning process um, more usefully, perhaps. So before I start with what Planning Inspectorate does, perhaps just a moment or two about what planning is. Um, I was speaking to Carl Sargent, the minister, a few months ago, and we had quite a, an interesting conversation on this topic. And we, we, I settled on, on this as a series of words. Planning is about placemaking for the well-being of our communities that we serve to create vibrant and sustainable places in the public interest. And we will be judged not just by the existing stakeholders, constituents, you can put there, but also those yet to be born and those yet to be involved in the planning process or the political process. And that's quite a difficult challenge for most people. Planning is about securing and managing development to shape those places, to make them the vibrant and sustainable places that we wish to enjoy. And planning should not prevent necessary and acceptable development, but it should manage that change. That's what we're about at whatever level we're working. Now, in terms of planning, the LDP, Local Development Plan Process, is front-loaded and needs early local engagement. That sounds horrible, horrible cliché, but I hope you understand what it means. You need to get involved. Community Council involvement at that early stage, at the vision and the strategy stage, is important. Not just when the local planning authorities say, this is where development is likely to happen in terms of site specifics, or when planning applications come in. It's at that early stage. How do we wish this place to develop to make it a vibrant place in the future? I'm sure some of you have been in business. You write business plans. Well, that's the sort of thing. What's the vision? Where do we want to go? How are we going to get there? What are the constraints on getting there? What are the control mechanisms we need to make sure that happens? How do we monitor it to make sure it happens? What do we need to change? It, there's a, uh, an analogy there with development plans. Now, in Wales, we have a, a history of, if you like, bottom-up <coughs> plans, town and village plans, and design statements. That, and the production, uh, they're, they're produced in, in association with community councils and town councils. And actually, I just happened to notice, not a plug, because I'm not on sponsorship, but I've noticed this today actually includes quite an interesting article about how local communities can get involved with local village and community plans, community planning. It's quite an interesting uh, development. Now certainly local councillors are well placed to provide a local input and appreciation of, if you like, the fine grain of places in the planning process and to as assist the local planning authorities developing the, the vision as to how a place should develop in the future. Perhaps that's my, my soapbox, but uh, I think it's useful sometimes just set a context to what we're doing here. I'll have to put it there and pick it up. <laughs> um, moreover, local d development plans uh, and guidance that is consistent with the local planning authority's statutory plans can assist in seeing development that meets the local aspirations and the preferences of a locality when they come forward. Similarly, they can give developers a clear steer as to what might be welcomed. Now, just across the border in Shropshire, this has been really being driven forward by local communities and the local planning authorities to create local partnerships. And if you aren't familiar with what's happening in Shropshire, it's quite a useful exercise to investigate that. So I've hit the key at the wrong time, so I'll come on to the role of PINs now. PINs, the Planning Inspectorate, it's, a, it's an acronym that I'll, I'll use. Now, PINs is an organisation that administers and facilitates the process, uh, the, the process for inspectors. The inspectors conduct planning and other appeals, the mani managing change and development. And we examine local development plans that guide that future development. 
what PINs doesn't do is to develop planning policy. That is Welsh Government's role. We use planning policy developed by Welsh Government. And we do not produce housing projections to say how a place is likely to grow over the next um, 10 or 15 or whatever years. Again, Welsh Government's role. We have to have regard to those figures. Um, and we don't assess the performance of local planning authorities. We're not Ofsted for uh, the planning departments. Um, and we don't conduct national infrastructure uh, projects conducted and uh, submitted under the 2008 Act. We don't deal with those. So the, the very largest energy schemes, that's not a matter for PINS Wales. That's dealt with by actually PINS England on behalf of the uh, UK government. So what is PINS? We were created as a government agency in 92, following about 100 years worth of um, resu uh, dispute resolution in terms of environmental matters. Um, the inspectorate itself is, all, is an organisation with two separate sections. The main section dealing with England is dealt with in, in Bristol. Um, and then all matters dealing with Wales is dealt with in Cardiff under my direction. Now, the thing, the DNA of PINs and all inspectors and all people dealing, working in PINs are based on the Franks Report of 1957. And these are the main, I say, it's in the DNA of inspectors. Fairness. Everything that's, that everyone has a chance to put their case to an inspector at an appeal or at an examination. It's completely open. There is nothing hidden. Everything that's available to an inspector is available to the parties to that appeal. There's no hidden briefing from the minister or from me, for example. There's no hidden agenda. It's all open, and anybody can put forward and see what everybody else has seen. And the inspector is totally impartial. He, the, the inspector is an independent tribunal. As an individual, <laughs> that person is a tribunal in law. But they are totally impartial. I can't tell an inspector what decision to make on an appeal. The minister similarly can't tell an inspector what decision to make on an appeal. It's entirely up to that individual. And it's an individual as opposed to the inspectorate, which is an organisation that facilitates that. So decisions are made by inspectors. Now, in terms of the appeal process, I'm sure you're familiar with this generally, but local planning authorities refuse about 12% of applications coming to them in Wales. 12%, 88% are approved. So what the planning inspectorate deals with are those appeals against those refusals, and that actually is about 3% of all the applications that come through the system. Now clearly there is a right of appeal to the Welsh ministers, and the Welsh ministers appoint individual planning inspectors through me um, to determine those appeals on his or her behalf. It's about 99% of the cases are dealt with by an individual inspector. The Welsh ministers recover the jurisdiction, if you like, um, for about, it's between half and 1%. Uh, depends on the year, but it's, it's around, about that, around about that figure. Again, an, inspector's, an inspector's decision can only be challenged in the High Court on a point of law or irrationality. No reasonable person could come to such a judgment based on the evidence submitted. That's the test. So the challenge to, the, to an inspector is to the High Court. Unfortunately, we have a um, quality standard of 99% error-free. 1% of all case, cases all work. That, that is the, that is, uh, that's the error margin. Fortunately, we, we hit that target year after year. I hope we continue to do so. So the types of appeal, there are three main types that we, I'm sure you're familiar with. There's written representations dealing with about 74, 75%. The hearings, which is a, a discussion around the table. It's a small scale event. Uh, there's a discussion around the table with the main parties involved. It's public. People can go there and listen and take part. And there's a site inspection. About 21% are dealt with in that way. And then there's the, the public inquiry, um, more judicial, more adversarial, there's usually advocates of one sort or another calling witnesses and so forth. That's about 5%, again, with a site inspection following the, 
the examination in that almost courtroom situation. The development plans, which I'm familiar with, are obviously local planning authorities are obliged to produce the LDP. It's their vision, informed by the, by the constituents within that area. It's their vision of the future and how to manage development. Now, the inspectors are charged with the responsibility of examining that plan, hearing to representations, if you like, people who object to the council's vision, to, and to ensure that it's soundly based, based on good evidence that is consistent with national policy, that it is co coherent and it makes sense, and that there's been proper consultation. The inspector's role is not to make it the best plan. It, so long as it is sound, it makes sense, it's based on sound evidence, is subject to challenge and stands up to challenge, then it will be found sound. So who are the inspectors who do all this? Well, they're, they're, they're professionals, chartered town planners like myself, architects, engineers, lawyers, um, and then highway engineers, water engineers, and people like that. Inspectors work at home, and that isolation from external influences ensures and supports that impartiality. So if an inspector has a problem with a case, they can't literally turn around and say, what would you do in this situation? The cat doesn't answer. You know, so it's quite difficult, and it's, but they're in that isolation to make a, a judgment in the same way as if any of you were magistrates or, or, or any other uh, part of the judiciary, you have to make a decision based on the evidence that you're presented with, not bringing in other matters. The impartiality, as I say, the inspector sees all the information available to all parties at the appeal. There are no private briefings. They cannot be uh, influenced by the minister or myself. And that impartiality is assured and jealously guarded. I've known situations years back where certain ministers, not necessarily in Wales, have tried to suggest inspectors <coughs> determine certain types of appeal in certain times of way. And it caused all manner of difficulties. And the inspectors said, no, we are impartial. We, are, we stand in your shoes. We hear what your policy is. And we will take it into account. But we are impartial. And we will have regard to the whole circumstances of this case, not, if you like, a political diktat. Now, the planning process, decision process, the appeal process, let's just deal with that for a moment. The development plan, the statutory plan, is the starting point. The law requires that it says if, if regard is to be had to the development plan, the decision should be made in, with regard to that development plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. Now, that's quite important because a development plan can be quite old. Fortunately, well, we've got about half coverage in, England, uh, in Wales at the moment. It's even less in, in England. Um, but, for example, um, there are some development plans that are quite aged now. 1996 comes to mind for, for one of them, and that's the statutory plan. But life has changed. The world has changed since that time. And so the material considerations might indicate an alternative decision. And that is the way it's, it's a balance between those factors. So it's, it, we're not predetermined by what the de development plan says. Material considerations will all come into it. But the LDP is the corporate vision of the local planning authority. It's the corporate vision of the council as a whole, though. It must be owned by the council and all the departments within it. So education must have regard to what the development plan says. This council suggests we develop in this direction. This is our vision. Social services, highways. But it's also serves external people. Do Cymru, for example, their business plan is based on where, de where development is likely to take place in the next 10, 15 years. So they need to be part of that process. So I say it's used internally within councils, but also externally. Material considerations, I say, that balancing, in, if you imagine, is some scales. Um, so what are they? Well, the courts actually, in the end, decide it's a matter of law, but the Planning Policy Wales says it's relevant, they're relevant to development and to the use of land in the public interest. It's a very broad um, <coughs> definition. But some of, the, some of the matters that can fall within that category, 
technical reports, highway safety reports, traffic counts, retail analysis, um, that sort of thing, uh, flooding risk an analysis. That's a material consideration that's very important in most decisions. Supplementary planning guidance. That might be guidance produced by a council, but it's also things like the village plans, the town maps that <coughs> can come from, from the grassroots and are consistent with the council's statutory plan and, and developed in association with them. Then we have these other things, materials, uh, ministerial statements, government circulars, court judgments, local and specific circumstances to an area or to a site, and representations from consultees. And obviously, the town and community councils are a consultee who voice an opinion about a particular proposal. So that is a material consideration that goes into the balance. So what makes a good decision, um, or decisions, they're, they're not based on non-planning matters, irrelevant matters. But they're based on evidence rather than assertions. And that's quite important, particularly for challenging traffic or technical matters. Um, and ones that can be justified and, and challenged at appeal. And of course, within the appeal structure and process, the cost regime is there to instill discipline on all participants. And an inspector is empowered to award costs against parties who act unreasonably and give rise to unnecessary expense. So there's, there's a disciplinary regime there as well. Handling public concerns. Clearly, they can be important and they are relevant if they are on matters about planning. But sometimes there are matters that aren't. And there are, sometimes you have things like perceived fear and concerns. They can be genuine, but they can equally be groundless, based on prejudice, based on misinformation, with no objective um, justification. Another point that certainly local councillors get involved with a lot, they may be um, under attack with loads of, loads of um, letters of objection about something, but they probably don't get a lot of letters saying, we're really in support of this. You know, we think this is a grand idea. So again, be careful about sheer volume, it's not enough. Look behind it. Is it, is it actually, is this, is this prejudicial? Is it somebody just having a, a rant? Is there some basis for this objection that actually touches the planning issue? I say, you will get objectors, you rarely get lots of supporters. You know, so just, it's uh, something just one has to bear in mind. And then clearly the decision maker, be it the local planning authority or one of my inspectors, has to judge what weight to give to those objections. A matter that comes up time and time again at appeal and gives rise to a lot of decisions at appeal that go against local planning authorities. It's called what we call the fallback situation. And sometimes it's very difficult to persuade local residents, local, local community, that yes, we have to grant permission for this because what could happen tomorrow without planning permission is even worse. Now certainly there are parts of Wales that we all know, some of us know quite well, uh, where you know, there's heavy metal banging activities going on. You know, noisy sites, lots of HGVs, can work at any time, day or night. It's been there for donkey's years. Oh, for the last 10 years, it's gone quiet. Nothing's happened. The last five years, it's gone quiet. The site looks totally dead. Legally, it may not be. Unless it is legally abandoned, the same use type could start tomorrow without going to the planning authority. However, the planning authority might be faced with an application for a use that's going to create traffic, but it's traffic that is of a different nature. It's you know cars as opposed to HGVs and skips and what have you. It's going to have an opportunity to impose conditions about operating hours. So they say, well, okay, which, which is worse? What could happen tomorrow without planning permission or something we can grant planning permission and we can get control of this and actually mitigate some of the disasters that we've had in the past? Now, that happens with those sort of big schemes, but also at res residential extensions. So you might have a rear extension, for example, that can go up to three metres or something like that. Somebody could put a two-metre fence up there just as well without planning permission. So they're talking about that as a difference in height or thereabouts. So is that worth refusing? You know, it's that sort of mental, intellectual thought that has to be looked at. It's called the fallback situation, because what happens, it goes to appeal, 
and that the opposing side says, well, actually, we can, this could happen tomorrow, and this would generate this, this effect. Wouldn't this be better? And, you know, that's the question that is posed. Um, so fallback is interesting, important. Enforcement and Section 73. It's technical, I've used, but used that. Basically, what it amounts to is I was asked a question uh, by um, a councillor, hopefully not here, who said, when you get an appeal that says, um, for retrospective planning commission, do you treat it differently? And the th thought went through my mind. Well, this, this suggestion is that this developer, household developer, doesn't matter what, this developer has had the audacity to do this without planning permission. We need to punish that person. That is wrong. Because carrying out development without planning permission is unlawful, but it's not illegal. It only becomes illegal once there's been a, a successful enforcement notice that hasn't been quashed and it's, com and that it's activated. Because at every appeal on enforcement, the first ground of appeal is that planning permission should be granted. And so it's a deemed application for planning permission. And that has to be dealt with as if it was a proposal. Not that it's happened already, it's a proposal. And in law, that's the way we have to deal with it. So in other words, we deal with it exactly the same. Somebody might have done it without planning permission, but you still deal with it just the same. So in terms of appeals outcome, th these are the sort of bald statistics. I, I, I haven't gone into individual areas because that would be uh, uh, unfair. So at appeal, and these figures have been about the same for as long as I've been in planning, which is 39 years now. Um, 36, 33, 36% of appeals are allowed. And the local authority's decision is overturned. 63, 64% are support in support of the local council. And as I say, those figures are fairly static. Locally, in local, various local planning authorities, you'll get a slight deviation. But over Wales as a whole, those are the figures, well, those are figures 2008, 2012. Um, so as I say, that's the, that's the strike or hit rate, if you want to call it that. Third, two thirds. And that's, that's the outcome of most appeals. Now, in terms of um, the inspectorate, certainly, we try and ensure that all parties are actively engaged with planning appeals and certainly at um, planning inquiries, planning hearings. Um, we're very keen that people take part in those and also we're very keen and facilitate the use of Welsh in doing that. Um, certainly every communication with PINS Wales can be in Welsh as well as English. Um, and certainly in the north, we translate everything uh, th for three councils that we publish um, in Welsh as well as English. So if somebody writes to us in Welsh, they will get a reply in Welsh. I have case offices in Cardiff who are fluent. I have s about 25% of the inspectors who are what, fluent Welsh speakers as well. So um, we do try and accommodate that as well, and it's very much part of the department's mission that we, we facilitate that. So thank you, Chairman, for that. I've, I've got a minute less than half an hour, so hopefully that, that, that's, that's hit your target anyway. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Although I will give the, the, the caveat, I cannot, for obvious legal reasons, comment on anything that um, appeals that, um, developments that are currently live or within a, a challenge period. Thank you very much.